Today I'm going to be introducing uh, the Lagrange formulation for classical mechanics. So the Lagrangian which I'm going to note with this cursive uppercase L variable. Uh, so the Lagrangian formulation is a equal but different approach to solving classical mechanics problems. So for Newtonian mechanics, you first you draw your free body diagram where you label all your forces and you say what direction they're going in. And then you set up your Newton's second law problem. Set up. Which is just your F equals MA. And then three, depending on what you're trying to do, if it's a statics problem, uh, you could just be trying to find a certain force or um, some other variable like a spring constant or a coefficient of friction, or you could be doing a dynamics problem and in which case you're going to find the acceleration. And then depending on the problem, you can plug if the if the if the acceleration is constant, you can plug that into your kinematics equations and you have the equation of motion for that system. And the equations of motion are just the equations that tell you what velocity and position that object will be at different times. But if you have an acceleration that isn't constant, like in a pendulum or a, a spring mass spring system, uh, then the equations of motion are not so simple and you would have to solve a differential equation to get those equations of motion. So this is the procedure for Newtonian mechanics, uh, but I'm going to show you the procedure for Lagrangian mechanics. So the first system we'll start off with will be a mass spring system. And so let's say that the there's a wall here that a spring is attached to and there's a mass M on that spring in the spring has some spring constant k. So, and let's say that the ground is down here. Now the, the mass is free to move in the x direction, so you could imagine it has some velocity in the x direction when it's moving. So it would have some kinetic energy, which I'm going to label with the capital letter T equal to one half mv squared. And maybe we'll write it as vx just to make things simple or precise, I guess. And because this mass is on a spring, we know it has some spring potential which will, all of our potential energies will label with a V. As one half K X squared. Now I'm going to rewrite this velocity as the time derivative of position because we know that velocity in x direction is the derivative of the x position with respect to time. And instead of writing a fraction every time, we can
can simplify that to just x with a dot over top. Okay, so now we've written down our kinetic energy and our potential energy for this system. And so now our procedure for using the Lagrangian So step one, we're going to write down the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is just the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. So that's why on the previous slide we wrote down those two things. Then step two is going to be to um, do the derivatives in the Euler-Lagrange equation. So the Euler-Lagrange equation looks like this. So you have the total time derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity and that equals the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the position. So when I say to do the derivatives of the in the Euler-Lagrange equation uh, that means that these two partial derivatives and then this one total time derivative. And then step three will be to solve the differential equation that we get when we complete step two. Okay, so let's do all these things. So for our spring mass system, the Lagrangian is one half m x dot squared minus one half k x squared. Okay, so now we have to do some derivatives. So the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity. So the first term has a velocity in it, so um, the derivative of x dot squared would just be 2x, so we have 2 times 1 half, which just becomes 1, so we're left with m x dot. The second term doesn't have an x dot in it, so we don't, because we're only doing a partial derivative, we don't, there's no dependence on x dot. Then the total time derivative of the partial with respect to x dot, so the total time derivative of mx dot becomes mx double dot. And then the last partial derivative, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to x. Okay, so we have a the first term, there's no x, there's only x dot. So if we do a partial derivative, the first term is zero, the partial derivative of the first term. And then the second term, there is an x. So the partial derivative of x squared is two x, the two and the one half canceled. So we're just left with negative k x. Okay. Now we write down our Euler-Lagrange equation, which you could just write as EL. And so that says that the, uh, the total time derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity equals the 
partial of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to position. Okay, so we just did all those on the previous page. So we get mx double dot equals uh, negative kx. And so as an aside, this is just ma equals negative kx, which is just f equals negative kx. So this is just Hooke's law and Newton's second law. So it's important that we get the same answer doing things a different way. And um, this just reaffirms that we're, we're on the right path here. Okay, so now we have a second order differential equation. And we've talked about how to solve these kinds of equations previously. Uh, so the um, the way to do that is to uh, first isolate the the second order differential. So if we divide every term by m, we would get this. And now solving this uh, second order differential equation, you can one one way to do this is to replace the second derivatives with some variable a squared. You would replace first derivatives with a variable a. And then no derivatives uh, would just be a constant. There would be no a dependence. So that would make this look like a squared plus k over m equals zero. And maybe instead of a constant, we'll just say you replace all the x's with ones. And so solving this for a, you get a equals plus or minus square root of k over m. Okay, so now what we do with that uh, little polynomial that we just solved. Uh, so we had a equals plus or minus square root k over m, is we can plug this a term into some general solutions for this type of differential equation. So one of those general forms would be uh, something like b e to the negative square root k over m t plus c e to the positive square root k over m t. And so this is uh, just a general solution to this differential equation. Another way that we can write it, uh, which is not necessarily super obvious in the beginning is to just write this exponential in um, complex form. And so this i is the square root of negative one. So this is an imaginary number. Um, and this is, so this is a solution to this uh, second order differential equation. Uh, and the reason that we're invoking uh, going into the complex numbers, so complex numbers or the complex plane, uh, is that we can use a formula called the called Euler's formula. And Euler's formula relates the um, 
exponential of an imaginary number to uh, sines and cosines. So Euler's formula says that e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. So how is this useful? So one of the convenient things that we can do in math and physics is because we live in the real world, um, we can just take any, so any equations where we have a complex component, we can just ignore those and take the real parts of those equations. So if we take the real part of e to the i theta, the so that would be like taking the real part of cosine theta plus i sine theta. And you could break the right hand side up. So let's look at the real parts here. So because i sine theta has a an i in it, an imaginary or complex number, uh, the real part of that is just zero. And so you're left with cosine theta. So the real part of e to the i theta is just cosine theta. And what this lets us do is it lets us convert exponentials to um, cosines and sines. So if we look at our general solution here, x of t equals d e to the i square root k over m t. Another way that we can write this is x of t equals a cosine of omega t, where omega equals square root k over m. And so this cosine, we know if we plotted a cosine graph, it would be, uh, maybe that's a sine graph. Uh, cosine graph would be that. Uh, we get some periodic motion and that's why a mass spring system uh, undergoes periodic motion. Uh, so this omega is the angular frequency uh, square root k over m. This a term is the amplitude, amplitude of the spring mass masses motion on the spring. Uh, we can get the period of this by doing uh, one over omega, which is square root m over k. So it's, you end up with all the same answers you get when you do Newton's laws. Uh, it's just a different way of thinking about things. And where this is gonna be powerful is that when you make systems more complicated, like you start adding wind resistance or friction or you start, instead of just letting the pendulum or the um, mass spring oscillate freely, you can uh, drive the, the oscillation. Um, or uh, like I said, with the, the friction and the air resistance, you can dampen the oscillation and uh, setting your problem up using the Lagrangian uh, is a bit easier when you're treating those systems. Uh, and then kind of the, the main goal moving forward with the Lagrangian is that um, when you start doing higher level physics, uh, like electricity and magnetism or um, 
special and general relativity, those are all based on the Lagrangian. So if you understand how to use and manipulate the Lagrangian, you'll be more successful in those uh, different and more advanced areas of physics. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Keep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.